we're not allowed to just break into somebody's apartment, protested my brother Alex. What if someone's home and they call the police? We'll get grounded for sure. That place has to be vacant, I replied. I haven't seen anyone go in or out since we moved in, before you were even born. And mom and dad aren't going to find out. They won't even be home until Sunday. Alex eventually caved. We climbed up using the outer fire escape. The heat wave left us both drenched in sweat as we ascended the seven flights of stairs. There it is, I said, motioning to the slightly ajar window I'd spotted from the street. Just be careful, please, begged Alex, eyeing the distance down. I promised him I wouldn't drop him. He climbed onto my shoulders, reached up, and placed his palms under the rail. With a grunt, he managed to raise the window and crawl inside. All right, I called. Just find a way to unlock the front door. I'll be right there. I hurried down, re-entered the building, and took the elevator up. When I reached the apartment's front door, I knocked lightly three times. To my relief, it creaked open, revealing Alex inside. It's like you said, he whispered. Nobody's home. His face was pale, and I realized he was shivering. Great, I said through a grin. Is it okay if I go now? Asked Alex as he crept into the hallway. I can just go back to our apartment or wait out here while you stop being such a sissy, I said as I placed my hand over his face and shoved his scrawny form back into the room. We'll go back together when I'm done. The first thing I noticed was just how cold it was. If nobody lived here, as I suspected, then someone was paying a hefty electric bill to keep it at such a low temperature. I flipped on the main overhead light, revealing a compact and relatively barren space. A coat closet to my right was empty, aside from three pairs of formal brown shoes. The cobwebs that stretched across the antiquated bathroom indicated that no one had entered in some time. The shelves, drawers, and pantry in the small kitchen were also bare. Strangely though, it included not one, but two refrigerators. The first was imposingly large, its frame, painted a metallic gray, was at least seven feet tall. What are you doing? asked Alex as I tugged at its main handle. Just trying to see if there's anything in here worth taking. Maybe they've got soda or beer or something. I sighed with frustration though, as I realized that it wouldn't budge. You said we were going to look around, not steal things. I ignored him as I approached the second refrigerator. It was slightly smaller, with a sickly yellow color that matched portions of the tacky floral wallpaper behind it. Its single compartment opened with ease, revealing only an empty space inside. I turned to Alex. If you keep whining, I taunted, maybe I'll shove you in here. Alex quieted down. We entered the living room, which contained two long, wide divans with sunken white cushions that encircled an outdated television. Ugh, is there anything of value here? I whined as I sifted through a small set of VHS tapes stacked next to a dusty VCR. Balto, Annabelle's Wish, Toy Story, Ghostbusters, Batman and Robin. None would be worth the effort to sell online. Let's go, Alex insisted. Maybe somebody does live here. They could come home any moment. Plus, there's nothing here worth taking. There is one thing, I said, motioning to a mini fridge that sat between the sofas. It was tiny, with a murky olive finish. If you want to leave so badly, carry this back to our apartment. You want me to help you steal it? No way. Just do this one thing and you can go now, okay? Uh, fine, moaned Alex. He called back to me as he carried it into the hallway. But if I get caught, I'm blaming you. Whatever, I said. I'll catch up with you in a minute. As I stepped into the bedroom, I sensed a vague hissing sound growing in the kitchen behind me. 
I started to feel uneasy, but I pressed on. I had one more room to explore. The bedroom consisted of a king-sized mattress that lay in the center of the carpeted floor. Next to it sat a small pile of cushions, and on the other side stood a wooden dresser. I pulled open the top drawer, my heart beat in excitement as I finally hit the jackpot. An orange pouch contained jewelry and a set of vintage coins, Sacagawea, Susan B. Anthony, and silver dollars. Next to it sat a thick stack of out-of-circulation $2 bills held together by a rubber band, along with a set of stamps, envelopes, and wallet loaded with additional cash. The wallet also contained several outdated credit cards, a library card, a checkbook, and an old driver's license all displaying the name James A. Herman. I had a vague memory of my parents mentioning a Mr. Herman living in the building when I was little, before Alex was born, something about him running an appliance company. But where was he? And how had I never seen him before? I returned to the living room carrying some of the more valuable items I'd found in the dresser. To my surprise, the chill I'd felt before had faded. The room was getting warmer. I noticed smoke rising from the kitchen. Suddenly, the overhead lights cut off. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, my feet sensed a vibration in the floor. Slowly, I discerned the silhouettes of two bulky objects in the kitchen, the refrigerators, and they were shaking. As the shaking grew more violent, the hissing grew even louder. The door to the silver fridge burst open. I screamed as the light inside revealed a human skull and pile of bones stripped of all flesh that tumbled out onto the floor. Shocked, I stumbled backwards. The larger fridge emitted a low-pitched gurgle. In my panic, I reversed into one of the couches. As I lost balance, the refrigerator launched a set of small pointed objects. A sharp piece of ice scraped against my right hand as I fell. I dropped to the floor as the rest of the barrage hit the wall behind me. What the hell was happening? I thought as I peeked up, observing the large fridge. In the darkness, I couldn't be sure, but it seemed that it had somehow moved closer to me. The gurgling sound started up again. As its volume rose, I sensed a brief window of safety before it unleashed a new volley. Moving quickly, I picked up the valuables I'd taken from the dresser and sprinted towards the entrance hopping over the pile of bones as I made my way past the refrigerators. As soon as I reached the hallway, I slammed the door shut behind me and raced back to our apartment. What are you so worried about? Asked Alex upon my return. You're the one who looks scared now. Shut up, I said between frantic breaths as I latched our front door and applied the chain lock. Alex's wide-eyed expression alerted me that something was off about my appearance. I realized that blood dripped from the cut on my hand. Oh, right. I, uh, it's nothing. Just get me the first aid kit, okay? That cut looks bad. How'd you get it? Just get me the kit, okay? Hurry up already. Alex shot me a concerned look before heading to the kitchen closet. I deposited the belongings I had stolen on a counter and peered through the peephole into the hallway. Shit, I thought, as I noticed the trail of red liquid that led from the staircase to the door of our apartment. The hallway lights flickered as the door to the staircase I would taken slowly swung open. My fear froze me in place as an approaching form cast a long shadow over the bloody trail I'd left on the carpet. Alex nudged me with the first aid kit, sending me whirling around. Jesus, I called as my heart pounded in my chest. What's wrong? Asked Alex. A loud knock thundered against the door. Don't answer that, I said to Alex. Hello, rang a familiar, friendly voice. It's just Mr. Marlin, said Alex. 
I waited, paralyzed, as Alex quickly undid the chain and opened the door. Relief washed over me as we found ourselves facing only our longtime neighbor. Hey there, your mother asked me to check in on you. He removed his hat as he stepped closer to me. I realized he'd spotted my wound. You, uh, you doing okay there, Frank? I see you're the one responsible for the stain in the hallway. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, just a splinter. I stammered as I scanned the vacant hallway behind him. I was just about to bandage it. Mr. Marlin helped me dress the wound. Alex maintained a sour, disapproving expression as I concocted a story about nicking my hand on a wooden handrail on the way back from the park. Thankfully, he didn't speak up to contradict me. Nor did Mr. Marlin notice the pile of valuables on the counter. After Mr. Marlin left, I felt my rational senses return to me and realized the absurdity of my paranoia. The refrigerators had just malfunctioned or broken down or something. It's not like they were coming after me for stealing money from them. That would be ridiculous. I didn't get a good look at them anyway. But what about the bones? Did they belong to Mr. Herman or someone else? Were they even real? I needed to tell the police about it. But I knew that if I did, that would only come back to bite me now that I was in possession of stolen goods from the apartment. I decided to stay silent, at least for now. As I set up the mini fridge in Alex's and my shared room, I realized I still had Alex to worry about. He was clearly angry at me. If he stayed that way, he could very well confess what I'd done to our parents. I needed to get him back on my side and then clean up the trail I'd left behind. Hey, Alex, what do you say we go to Marco's down the street for dinner? You always love it there and it's on me, okay? He brightened up as we devoured the pizza we ordered. When we were done, he looked quizzically at the set of $2 bills I left on the table. That money was from the apartment we broke into, isn't it? Asked Alex as we headed home. Oh, come on, I retorted. What's it to you? I don't like it, said Alex. I think you should return it. I laughed. Yeah, right. For all we know, nobody even lives there. And this money's been sitting there unused for years. And who cares? It's ours now. Whatever, he said. His persistence started to get to me. When we stopped at a convenience store, I began to pay for the snacks I purchased with the money from the apartment. Only, I changed my mind at the last moment, instead paying with my own cash from my wallet. At the time, I wasn't sure why I did that. That night, I scrubbed up the bloodstains as best I could. In our bedroom, I counted the money I'd stolen. It totaled over $1,500. I remembered Alex's suggestion that I return it. I'd been so excited about keeping it before. But why did Alex's idea hold such a strange appeal to me now? The buzzer rang. It was Mr. Marlin. I seem to have forgotten my key. Would you all mind letting me into the building? Sure, I said, hitting the button for enter. Was that Mr. Marlin? Asked Alex. Yeah. He left his hat. How about you and I give it back to him when he comes up here? I groaned. Alex was so sanctimonious. But I gave in. Sure, if it makes you happy. We waited by the elevator. When the door opened, Alex held out the hat with a grin. The elevator chimed as its doors opened. Alex! I cried, but it was too late. The compartment of the yellow refrigerator that stood before us burst open. A pinkish tissue emerged, rapidly wrapping around Alex and tugging him inside. I grabbed onto him and pulled him back. The refrigerator let out an intense hissing sound as it shook angrily. The force against Alex grew until it was too much. Alex let out a gargled cry as he flew from my arms and into the refrigerator. 
Its door slammed shut, and then the elevator doors did the same. No, no, no. I repeated, aghast, as the elevator headed upwards. It was all my fault. I ran back to our apartment. I decided to gather everything I'd stolen and bring it back. As I passed through our kitchen, the closet door shot open as a large gray form ambushed me. I'm sorry, I screeched as I crashed into a kitchen chair. I fell, then looked up to see the refrigerator leaning over me. It was collapsing, as if to crush me. I rolled away as its heavy structure landed on the chair and shattered it into pieces. I hurried to my bedroom, where I threw all the money, jewelry, and coins I'd stolen into a gym bag. The door burst open, the gray fridge shifting its weight from its front to its back inched its way in. The yellow fridge now followed. Here, I yelled as I tossed the gym bag towards them. Take it, I only spent a little, almost all of it's still here, please. Just give Alex back and leave us alone. The refrigerators ignored the gym bag as they closed in on me. As they cornered me, all my mistakes flashed through my mind. It was my role to set an example for my brother, and all I'd done was bully him and pressure him to help me commit a crime. I'd only taken him out for dinner because it was in my interest to do so. Family is what really mattered. Right? I gently lifted the mini fridge. The refrigerators halted their advance as I held it out to them. Here it is. I'm so sorry. I gulped and took a deep breath. We didn't mean to take your child. I deposited the mini fridge on the floor and backed slowly away. The refrigerators remained still. My heartbeat intensified as I wondered if I'd guessed wrong or worse, if I'd guessed right, but done something to hurt their offspring. The yellow refrigerator's compartment opened. My brother rolled out, his body covered in a tattered layer of pink goo. An instant later, the mini fridge hopped inside. Alex, I yelled. He was cold, but still breathing. He opened his eyes. What? What happened? Behind him, the door to the yellow fridge closed. The pair turned away from us and waddled out of our apartment. I took Alex back the next day. I placed the gym bag I'd stuffed with the jewelry, coins and cash outside the door and proceeded to knock twice. I know you don't care about this other stuff we stole, I said, but we decided to bring it back anyway, okay? We're just gonna leave it here and we won't be bothering you about this again. I promise. Alex and I moved on. I've been nicer to him since. When I'm on the bus home from school, I always look up as we approach our building. Sometimes, for a brief moment, I'll glimpse an olive shaded box peering down at me. It's grown a bit in the months that have passed. I usually wave at it. And once, I could have sworn that it shifted excitedly to the left and then to the right, as if to wave back.